So disc suspect and borderline IOP. Is it glaucoma? Evaluating a patient with a possible diagnosis of glaucoma is a challenge. We call them glaucoma suspects and they are the people who are at risk of losing visual function from glaucoma but in whom glaucomatous damage is not clearly evident. So classified as a glaucoma suspect in this particular case scenario is based on borderline IOP and a suspicious optic disc appearance. It's very important to take a good history here because you need to know the risk factors that the patient has like higher IOP, older age, family history, African race, uh, thinner corneas, lower ocular perfusion pressure, type 2 diabetes, myopia, lower systolic and diastolic blood pressures, disc hemorrhage, large cup disc ratio and higher pattern standard deviation on the threshold visual field testing. So, making sense of intraocular pressure. Intraocular pressure, as we know, still today is the only treatable factor. And uh, intraocular pressure is a variable factor. When we examine the patients at our office, that's probably the lowest intraocular pressure that we are measuring because the Hamilton Sleep Laboratory evaluated that intraocular pressure is highest in the supine position. So the gold standard, as we all know, is the Goldman Applanation Tonometry. But after using it for more than half a century, we realized that we need to correct it for the CCT. And though there is no particular formula to correct IOP for the CCT, but a 70 micron for every 5 millimeters of mercury is considered good. So intraocular pressure does have diurnal variations. So what we see is actually the office IOP. We could do a random IOP at different times of the day at the office. And Asrani et al. having done good work on intraocular pressure concluded that positively screened eyes in the morning could have, missed, have been missed in an afternoon clinic. So the uh, ocular hypertension treatment study actually tells us to measure IOP and take the average of at least four to six readings of either eye and also the CCT needs to be measured at least five readings with averaging of both the eyes. Family history is very important. Those with a positive family history of glaucoma and being glaucoma suspects definitely need to be followed up. Coming to optic disc evaluation, which is perhaps the most important aspect of diagnosing glaucoma clinically. So if you look at, when I look at a disc like this at my office, I would actually wonder whether this kind of a disc is glaucomatous. So structural loss, as we all know, precedes functional loss. And if you do not examine the disc carefully, you could actually miss 55% of your patients. So optic disc changes in glaucoma, there are many, but the most important ones like loss of isn't pattern, localized notch in the rim, which are the uh, absolutely diagnostic factors for glaucoma, disc hemorrhage, large cup disc uh, size, vertically oval cup, bearing of the circumlinear vessels, a large CDR, and uh, many others. So uh, the basic of examination of the optic disc, the five R's for assessment of the optic disc in glaucoma, observe the scleral ring to identify the limits of the optic disc and its size, identify the size of the rim, examine the retinal nerve fiber layers, examine the region of parapapillary atrophy, and look for re uh, retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. I shall go into a little bit detail of these. Uh, so to find out the scleral ring, you actually need to uh, define the borders of the disc and the vertical and disc diameter as well as the horizontal disc diameter. Measurement of the optic disc size is of immense importance and we generally measure it for stereoscopic examination at the slit lamp with a high plus power lens using the manufacturer's given constant for uh, conversion and the average vertical diameter is about 1.8 millimeter and the average, average horizontal is 1.7 in uh, average disc. So the size of the disc is very important because uh, that's an average size disc. So if you look at a disc like this, many of us would actually rule it out as it's not glaucoma and it's 
more often that we overdiagnose glaucoma in larger discs because they have larger cups. So actually all three of these are glaucomatous, but it's easier to diagnose it in an average or larger side disc than it would be in a smaller disc. So uh, neuroretinal rim, that is of paramount importance. And here actually you need to see the limits of the cup defined by the contour and not by the color. And uh, the area, the configuration, and the pallor need to be seen. The isn't rule, which is a very basic rule, where the distance between the border of the disc and uh, the position of the blood vessel bending out, that's the inferior. And we uh, know that the inferior is the uh, thickest, followed by the superior nasal, and finally temporal. So the isn't rule needs to be intact if you want to uh, uh, say your, uh, to your patient that you could actually carry on and don't need to come for follow-ups that frequently. So the parapapillary atrophy, the alpha zone is what we are not interested in. What we're interested in is the beta zone, the atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium where the choriocapillary vessels actually show through and that's the beta zone which we're interested in and it is definitely uh, diagnostic of glaucoma. Optic disc hemorrhages, if you look at that, the first picture on your right, that's a, a very subtle uh, hemorrhage out there which could be missed. And then there is this one. And finally, you uh, have this one where uh, you could actually miss it if you're not careful. So optic disc hemorrhage surely needs to be followed up. And it could land up in something like this, where you have the notch and uh, inferior notch is almost pathognomonic of glaucoma. So the, to examine the RNFL, you need to actually follow the anatomical distribution of the nerve. And if you look at that, uh, the bright silvery striations that you see along the distribution of the nerve could actually uh, mean something. And uh, you have the diffuse uh, RNFL loss and the localized RNFL losses. The cup disc ratio, which is very important, so this is a basic, I don't know if there are any uh, postgraduate students here, but then when you actually define the size of the cup, you need to assign uh, one to the disc, and then you measure the inferior uh, rim and the superior rim, and say in this case it's 20.20 uh, plus 0.15, that's 0.35, and you minus it from 1, so that gives you 0.65 as the cup disc ratio in this particular case. So uh, moving on to vascular changes on the disc. So you have a whole lot of vascular changes which you can see on the disc. Uh, not all of them are always pathognomonic and not always can you see all of them, but what you can really see is nasalization of the vessels if you notice carefully. And you also see the bayoneting. The bayoneting, if you see out there, the blood vessel dipping out there at the uh, cup margin, that's called bayoneting and it, uh, it could really raise a suspicion. Then you have the progressive vascular loops that you see around out here, but of course uh, they could actually uh, disappear with lowered intraocular pressure. So the baseline risk factors for prognosis, age every 10 years has a 22% risk, IOP every 1 millimeter of mercury has a 10% risk, uh, CCT 40 microns dipper gives you a 71% risk, horizontal cup disc ratio 0.127%, vertical cup disc ratio 0.132% and pattern standard deviation gives you a 27% risk for every rise of 0.2 decibels on that uh, visual field. So the global risk assessment actually depends on um, uh, multiple risk factors based on evidence from well-controlled trials. And of course, it is modeled after the coronary heart disease risk assessment uh, guidelines and helps guide treatment decisions for optimal patient care. So the risk threshold to guide patient management, five years, low risk, less than 5%, you could actually monitor, moderate 5 to 15%, you need to consider treatment, and high risk, more than 15%, you definitely need to start treatment. So establish baseline and frequency of testing, document appearance of the optic nerve, measure visual function, discuss the need for ongoing evaluation with your patient. You need to talk to your patient. If it's a younger patient, the risks are substantially more because the lifespan is longer and treatment strategies should focus on moderate and high risk patients. So diagnosis is that hinge on a choice between two alternatives, yes or no. So 
better decisions through science, which we have achieved today, are a physician stares at an X-ray, agonized over whether an ambiguous spot is a tumor. A technician in an airport worries over a set of ultrasound readings. Do they suggest a deadly crack in the airplane's wings? Similarly, we think, is a person glaucomatous? And the next question is, is he or she progressing? So early diagnosis is a challenge. Clinical acumen needs to be aided with computerized tests available today. So millions saw the apple fall, but Newton asked why, and gravity was discovered. So with the new imaging techniques came pre-perimetric glaucoma. So if you look at that, that's a Heidelberg scan of the retinal nerve fiber layer. It's a peripapillary scan, the RNFL thickness. And uh, if you look at that, that pie chart out there actually gives you the borderline and the outside normal limit areas. You can compare it with the optic disc and the visual field as well. This is a normal one with the disc and the field. So... This is uh, where you can detect pro pro uh, progression, and <coughs> those are subsequent uh, overtime progressions which have occurred. And on your left-hand side, the Heidelberg actually gives you the opportunity to compare the thinning of RNFL with age and that of glaucoma. So you can make out in an elderly uh, person whether it is due to age, the RNFL decreasing, or it is uh, due to glaucoma. So highlighted findings and recommendations for care are a diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma suspect is established by the presence of number one, a consistently elevated intraocular pressure, suspicious appearing optic nerve, abnormal visual field. The risk factors for a primary open angle glaucoma suspect diagnosis include an elevated intraocular pressure, family history of glaucoma or glaucoma suspect, thin central cornea, race, older age, myopia, and type 2 diabetes. Decisions to treat a primary open angle glaucoma suspect depend on evidence of optic nerve change, any visual field defect, level of IOP, and other associated risk factors. And in the old study, overall of 90 to 95% did not actually develop glaucoma because they were treated. So the risk was reduced from 9.5% to 4.5%. So you should actually consider treatment if your IOP goes beyond a certain level. So Finally, what we need for the glaucoma suspect is the chair time. You need to give chair time to the patient, to help the patient, to teach the patient, tell the patient more about the disease, to guide the patient, and of course, advise the patient that what would be best for him or her. Support the patient, tell the patient it's not cancer, it's a chronic disease which needs to be lived with, no lifestyle changes, but to fo come for follow-ups and to use the medicines religiously. And of course, encourage to continue with a good lifestyle which he or she has been going on with all this time. And thank you for your attention.